And if for some reason interest rates keep climbing because a, the bond market is said to be smarter than the stock market. It can be forced underwater for a while, but it finds a way to bob to the surface and wreak its havoc on you. So either the bond market gets control and says, no, interest rates are going up. And why would they? Well, because our debt is growing at over seven, something like seven and a half percent a year, and it can't be serviced. And so you can make the argument, why would you ever buy a treasury returning not much, a long dated treasury. And if you don't, who's going to service all our debt, which they're fighting about in Congress. So I, I just, there's no point in history where markets like these didn't eventually slaughter people. On today's episode of What the Finance Podcast, I have the pleasure of welcoming back Dave Collum uh, for a third time. So I obviously uh, didn't scare you off last time, so, uh, but he's the professor, a professor of organic chemistry and leading thinker on markets and the large world around us. So thanks for coming back on, Dave. Uh, yeah, you didn't scare me off. I, you know, I've never done a, a podcast where someone did a hit job on me, interestingly enough. I, 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 you just made me think of that. I can't think of one where someone ambushed me. Maybe they didn't. I didn't know it. <laughs> Maybe you're just too relaxed. You're not. You're just happy to I'm have these sure open conversations. True. I'm not sure that's true. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah. Anyway, I guess since since we last talked, I know last time you were thinking we were going to see probably a bear market, and recently it, it's weird. It seems like bad news equals good things to the markets, and that's that trend's continued. I guess throughout the the whole year. So, in your opinion, why do you think that's happening? Is there anything else? I guess uh, from an economic spe- perspective that you're currently watching. Well. I'm I'm reading a book right now called um, uh, Bubble in the Sun, which is about the Florida real estate market. I've read so many books on bubbles. I, I, I after a while, I, you know, the guys now get to it. And they start to they start to mention something, and I, and I just fill in the blank for them, you know. And and but they reminded me that that it 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 often takes a, a very long time for what the markets ought to do to actually do. And, and I remember, for example, in, I thought the markets were nuts in 05 and 06, they were more nuts, um, the real estate market in particular. And then I told my class in 07 and in, in um, probably February or March that the banking system was gonna collapse. So I actually flat out called it. I had written about it in 02, so I was a little early on that one. Um, and then watched it take seemingly an eternity to happen. And um, so I think markets uh, have recency bias and, and they, they just, the, the, the participants just refuse to let go. And so it, it rolls, starts to roll over and it's like an iceberg calving off from, you know, the Arctic. And, and then, then once they get going, then all of a sudden it's, it's, you know, pin your hair back, pin your ears back time. And, and then it's over. So it's like an avalanche. And, uh, yeah. Are you seeing a similar thing at the moment then? Well, so it's moving very slowly. So here's, here's again, I can't remember. I have no idea what we talked about last time, really, besides bear markets. Uh, I've been thinking about things lately that have been bugging the crap out of me. So, for example, well, I just read an article this morning. NVIDIA is selling for 29 times sales. Now, I... Who in their right mind would buy a company for 29 times sales? They'd have to grow at a phenomenal rate for decades to to finally become fair value. So that that makes no sense. RCA back in 29 was selling for 60 or 70 times earnings, and that was considered the bubble stock. Um, So in any case, um, I, I read an article the other day about super stocks. And at first I dismissed it because it came off to me as one of those, if you don't own these six stocks, you didn't make any money and therefore you're an idiot, right? That sort of thing. That's, that was my first spin on it. And then I actually thought about it. I said, wait a minute, there's a deeper message there. And I, I actually couldn't remember where I read about them. So I reached out to Twitter. And of course, everyone sent me articles on Twitter, on super stocks. But the idea was, is that pretty much everything's coming from all the earnings and everything are coming from, you know, 10 stocks. Now, the message that most people take from that is you either A, have to figure out what those 10 stocks are going to be, which is impossible. 
um, because it's certainly not going to be the 10 of today. It's going to be some new 10 um, and everything's going to be AI. And I go monetize that, buddy. Um, and, and so you can't see that coming or you say, well, then you have to index to make sure you just catch the 10 stocks. And then you're doing a momentum trade because you're counting on the nonlinear relationship of the you know, market cap to, to, to the index. Um, and, and to me, the message became, and it quickly registered that, um, that out of 500 of the biggest stocks in the US, um, 490 weren't making any money. And, and that's what I focused on. And so if I were to buy a gas station down the road, I, first of all, would probably pay, I'm just going to throw, I'm spitball this one, maybe pay five times revenues for the gas station. Um, so when, when, when NVIDIA is trading for 30 times revenues, that should bother you. Um, and then, um, and then I realized that if I own that gas station in, in 10 or 20 or 30 years later, I had no cash flow. That would have been about the dumbest investment in the history of investments. So, so we've got 490 of the biggest stocks in the US that routinely return nothing. And they, therefore, the system is set up uh, for the actual owners to get none of the proceeds of an ongoing financial concern, right? So I, you know Microsoft is selling software. You know that you know various companies are selling oil and cars and you name it. But somehow the investors aren't getting it. Well, where does that come from? Why is that? And I have a theory, and one I actually bounced off. You're not going to believe this. I bounced it off John Bogle. And I don't know if he agreed or if he didn't understand my question. But I said to him, when we went to indexing, uh, is it possible that no longer was the market being overseen by huge, huge pension fund managers and money managers and stinking rich people who profoundly cared about the results and therefore would say to Jack Welch, you got to get your earnings up, dude, or we're going to sell you. And, you know, our fund is huge. And it's now democratized so that it's millions upon millions of Joe six packs all over the world. And no one cares about them. And so it's conceivable that it that that once we once we went to this highly democratized market, that that the incentive to pass the the booty down to the actual investor went to zero. And so we lost adult supervision. And I'm reminded of, and this kind of fits together into a story, I'm reminded of when Goldman paid itself a big bonus in, in 08 or 09, right after they got bailed out, and it was really disgusting. And I remember Maria Bartiromo said something about, well, you know, they had all these profits. So what else are they going to do with the money? And I go, how about give a dividend? You don't need to give big bonuses to your to your top C-suite employees. They're they're not. It's not a partnership anymore. It's a publicly traded company, but they view it as their money, not our money. And so, so I Bogle kind of nodded at that idea. He kind of conceded that idea, but I'm not sure he wasn't moving too quickly and not thinking too deeply. But um, and if that's the case, the other way to think of it is we've got this pie that's been growing it. You know, big think of it as a big slice of pizza that was owned by rich guys. And it grew at three and a half percent a year. And amazingly enough, um, Buffett, Arnaud, uh, Howard Marks, these guys say you can't make more than about four percent a year across the market sustainably. That's it. Buffett said four percent. That's it. And and so as we start selling slices of the pie, we cut it into smaller and smaller slices. And so you're getting a small and smaller piece of the pie, which is growing at three and a half percent, but the demand for the pie is growing at you know seven percent. And so all of a sudden you're getting this, you're getting shrinkflation on your equities. And and so I realized then that that's what was happening. And then I did some quick calculations. I, I look at, I know I'm just babbling incoherently here to you, but I, I look at um I look at valuations every couple of years to see where we're at. 
And now he's about 25 metrics. And evaluation is interesting because it always has an inherent inflation correction in it because it's the price of some market over divided by something that also sh both should track inflation. So price to GDP, price to earnings, price to sales, price to you name it, Tobin's Q, price to book. Um, and so it should just flutter around. Well, it turns out that what you notice if you look at valuations is they trothed in 1981, and we'll call it a PE of six. I hate PEs because they're the most easily fabricated valuation of them all. Um, and, and it has grown the valuation, which should just be fluttering around and regressing to the mean. It, it, there's nothing more mean regressing than valuation. Um, it, the valuation's compounded growth three and a half percent a year for 40 years. I, I can't imagine a worse recency bias than that. Three and a half percent a year, which it will give back someday because regression to the mean is a force of nature. And that, this is not some price of the market that can keep going up, but the valuation can't keep going up. And so that's a three and a half percent tailwind. What happens in the next 40 years if we have a three and a half percent headwind? That's a net 7% flip in the direction of the winds. You're Columbus, you're sailing the oceans, and all of a sudden you got a headwind. You're 7%, 7% in your face reversal. And, and so uh, then I go to, this is, uh, boy, I feel like I have ADHD. Then I go to a plot by Ron Grice of, the chart store, who's been great to me over the years, sending me all sorts of stuff. He sent me a, 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 a hundred years of the market not corrected for inflation, but corrected for the M2 money supply, which, which is one of the lower money supplies, but it also looks like a pretty good metric for inflation. It's kind of the money supply street level. And it turns out the markets haven't moved in a hundred years, corrected for M2 money supply. And so then the question is, well, then how have you gained it all? And the answer is that you've gotten dividends. And what are the dividends? Well, back decades, decades ago, they were 4%, now they're 2%, which means the markets are 2% factor of two overvalued. Now, when did this all go bad? Well, it was last year, the year before, I noticed that the valuations all took off in 94. Uh, it's uh, WTF 1994. What the fuck happened in 1994? And I thought maybe it was the bailout of the bond market, which was in turmoil. Michael Green chimed in and, and smacked me around a little. I didn't think it was totally necessary, but he has the right to. He's, he's more skilled than me. And he said, no, that's when indexing started. So now we've come full circle on indexing. So it's this, this tsunami of money flowing into the market. But, but you tsunami of money is either inflation or you can't win because, because someone's got to buy those assets from you. And, and your generation, I don't think, is ready to take possession of my generation's assets. There are McMansions out in the countryside that I have trouble picturing a 30-something buying. Um, we overbuilt our houses, you guys not only, I don't think can afford it, I don't think you'll want it. I think that's, I think the generational attitudes have changed. Small is better, green, right? The whole thing fits into this small footprint, small energy footprint. What are we gonna do with all those McMansions that they can't even heat? My two kids combined couldn't buy my house from me. So that's my rant. Yeah, it's really interesting. You cover lots of topics. So from what you're saying there, I guess, small small minority of the companies are really propping up, I guess, the, the index. <laughs> of nuts, but that's- being, And, and yeah. as companies, they suck. That's the other thing. This is not General Motors, US Steel, RCA. The, the, if Facebook went away, would you care? If Twitter went away, would you care? If Tesla went away, would you care? If If- Microsoft has gained sixfold in the last 10 years from valuation expansion. Just if they give back six years of valuation expansion, what a 
beating that would put on the market. And, and NVIDIA, right? NVIDIA is romping because of AI. AI to me is a nightmare of nightmares for society. So so, so, so rooting for NVIDIA is, is like rooting for payday lenders. Who do you say? Because I, I guess I think of Microsoft now. It's one of those companies that is in basically everything we do is almost connected, especially if you're working or if you're doing anything mm-hmm. like that, you're connected to Microsoft. Mm-hmm. And then I... Think of NVIDIA and I say, well, it's, you know, there's these industries going forward, which are going to be government backed and you probably shouldn't bet against them. And NVIDIA, semiconductors and NVIDIA seems like one of those. So then do mm-hmm. you say maybe there is a reason that they're so highly valued? Oh, there's a reason why they're so highly valued. <laughs> I, yes, I agree with that. Um, you, a, a Toyota Camry is a great car. If you paid 140,000 for one, it would be a bad idea. So, so the fact that these companies are important and do important things doesn't mean that you can win by overpaying. And, and there will be some moment in time where people say, holy shit, based on the price I'm paying, the market right now, the case Schiller PE is something like 30. The price you are paying for that market says that you're gonna make about 3%. You're 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 being paid. You're you're getting three percent return on that investment. Now, what's going to happen? Well, maybe you're going to get three percent for the rest of your life. Maybe they're going to grow at twenty percent for the next two decades and catch up. But but you've never ever you can't find a moment in history where collectively you can have this many overpriced monstrous stocks that didn't eventually inflict horror upon their owners. And as Edward Chancellor said in his book, The Price of Time, another one of these doom books, but Chancellor's great. So as soon as it came out, boom, I nailed it. He said that interest rates below 2% always lead to a shit show, always. Where'd we get to? Zero, right? We've got, we had corporate, we had, uh, Corporate junk bonds returning, I don't know, five or six percent. Argentina was returning five percent. Brazil, um, Greece. These are horror stories. And if for some reason interest rates keep climbing because A, the bond market is said to be smarter than the stock market, it can be forced underwater for a while, but it finds a way to bob to the surface and wreak its havoc on you. So either the bond market gets control and says, no, interest rates are going up. And why would they? Well, because our debt is growing at over seven, something like seven and a half percent a year. And it can't be serviced. And so you can make the argument, why would you ever buy a treasury returning not much, a long dated treasury? And if you don't, who's going to service all our debt, which they're fighting about in Congress? So. I I just there's no point in history where markets like these didn't eventually slaughter people. So there'll always be an explanation for why it's happening. It'll always feel like it can't possibly end. The Florida real estate boom was a great example, but some guys started doing the math and said, you know, if everyone in Chicago moved to Florida, we still wouldn't fill all the houses back in the 20s. There were Roger Babson, the famous Roger Babson, who called the 1929 crash. He called it for about four straight years, but he's the one who called it like the night before. And so it it gets called the Babson break. He He was flying all over the Florida real estate market buying crap. So he didn't see it. And I don't, I don't remember if he got really burnt and that's what taught him something. I don't, I, I, my retention of the book isn't as that good, I guess. Um, but it, it's it's it, something makes it break and it breaks, right? And I, I, my favorite metaphor was said by a guy named uh, God. I can't remember his name, but someone said, "Why can't they keep going up?" And you say, "Well, go in your children's room and start stacking their blocks, and keep stacking them." What happens? The higher the stack which represents displacement from equilibrium. 
A chemist knows what that is. That's where a reaction, when it goes, is going to put out a lot of heat. That's when an avalanche, when it goes, is going to do a lot of damage. And so you keep stacking the blocks and two things you know. One is when it finally goes, the pile of rubble is huge. The bigger the stack, the bigger the pile of rubble. And second of all, the bigger the stack, the less shock sensitive it becomes. And I think that metaphor works perfectly. When you are priced for perfection in any market, it takes just a vibration to send it heading for the door because smart guys are going to go, first out wins, I'm out. And then the second guy say, well, I'm a little burnt. I'm a little leveraged. You got to get out before it goes bad. And then next thing you know, that avalanche is, avalanche is ripping down that mountain pass. So I think the bank fails. By the way, the bank failures in the, it, the bank failures that caused the depression, this I didn't know. They started around 1926. I did not know that. They were, banks were starting to fail in the Southern states. And eventually they knocked off 12,000 banks. But in 1926, you were getting these warnings. One of them we call, let's call one SVB. One, you know, right? That we have all these banks and people say, oh, that's because they were idiots. They didn't hedge. I hate that they didn't hedge argument. If I had told you in a podcast four years ago that this regional bank is going to be destroyed because it's taking its cash and buying treasuries. What kind of insane world is that? And then they say, well, they didn't hedge. Okay, so let's say all the regional banks hedged. Who's gonna pay off the hedges? Who owns those hedges? And then I was reminded of back in, in 2008, when the show's hitting the fan and the CEO of Citigroup, who I can't remember who it was at that point, wasn't Sandy Wild. I don't remember who it was. They said, well, don't worry, we're fully hedged. And I go, who, by the Klingon Empire? Who can hedge Citigroup? How many hedge funds does it take to hedge Citigroup? And then who's going to bail out the hedge funds? Who, by the way, are leveraged up the kazoo to Citigroup? <laughs> right? So the guys who own the hedges are getting the money to buy the hedges from Citigroup. So I, it's just an absurd system. The regional banks are being criticized for running poorly, while monetary policy is making it impossible to run a bank rationally. Because they drove rates to the level where you can't be a bank. And now we're discovering they weren't doing a very good job at being banks. Why am I not shocked, right? And we haven't even begun to see the corporate debt collapses and the commercial real estate collapses. We're hearing rumors of the expensive car repos, right? You know, that guy, Lucky Louie, that uh, I think um, I think Danielle interviewed. It's Lucky Lopez, maybe. Lucky Lopez. Yeah, I knew it was Lucky someone. He must have <laughs> done something well when he was younger. So, so that's where we're at, and it's not happening yet, but if I put a big block of ice out on the sidewalk, it eventually would become water, but not today. It, but it will be, it will get there because that's the thermodynamics. Yeah, it's interesting. Do you think maybe something like this, I guess, debt ceiling conversation that we're having in the US could, could be that? Or do you think this is going to be, uh, you know, a red herring? It's not a cause. I think it's a terrible red herring. I here's here here's what I think is going on with that stuff. This is like so. Whenever Congress is arguing over something, while they are arguing, the longer they argue, whether it's about bailouts, right? Remember how how long it took them to bail out the system? While that is going on, lobbying money is flowing like water in the streets. They win by protracted arguments, because Citigroup would then say, okay, send them some more goddamn money then. We need that bailout, right? So these guys are making fortunes. So, so while the debt ceiling is being battled, all the people who want them to do something in their favor is shoving money right up their asses. So that's what this is. This is the grift that keeps on grifting, right? This is, this is, this is what you're seeing. They love to protracted debates about money because they make it every time. Am I dark enough for you? 
I, I, this is the this is where the world seems so screwed up. I mean, we haven't I, we probably shouldn't either. But Ukraine, Afghanistan, you know, CBDCs, they're just every time I turn around, there's someone making a decision, lockdowns, COVID, vaccines that don't work. Every time I turn around, there's someone making a decision that couldn't possibly look worse. Name a good decision that someone's made recently. I, you can't. There's not. I've been I've been bird dogging shootings. I'm convinced that shootings are all FBI sponsored and CIA sponsored. I'm convinced all these shootings are all not only on the radars. You know, they always say, oh, yeah, you know, we had them on a radar and he sort of slipped through it. No, it's what, much worse than that. And I don't know why. It's just bad decisions that seem to seem to be targeted towards destroying us. You've lost half your listeners going, this guy's crazy. But um, the other half might be riveted. Who knows? That's right. Everyone's uh, each their own. So if we go back to... Um, I guess this banking crisis that we're seeing. So I'm assuming you're thinking that there's other banks out there that are going to have similar issues to what we've seen. And then, uh, yeah. If if there's not other banks out there, then this time is different. (laughs) The other thing is, it seems patently obvious, garishly obvious. And this garish is the word I keep using. It is as though they're gaslighting us with these bad decisions. It is as though they're saying, look, you know, Epstein was horrible and we all did perverted things with children and you can't do anything about it, right? Everything seems to Jamie Dimon looks like he just stole these banks. He's going to keep stealing them and he just keeps getting richer and his bank keeps getting more assets. He helped perpetu- He helped propagate the, the failure of SVB. He got out there and said, oh, by the way, if you feel unsafe, bring your money to us. What kind of statement is that in the middle of a bank crisis? Right? That's not exactly being uh, good of the community thinking. That's, that's, that's to God, that's, that seems like it broke some federal laws. Well, they can just change them afterwards and let them buy the bank, even though they're higher. Yeah. Than- <laughs> and meanwhile, Silicon Valley put a torch on. So here's a bank that's supposed to be as important as Silicon Valley and big swing and dicks in Dixon, Silicon Valley. Start talking about how they're going to go under. Who are they? Who's Peter Thiel working with? I, I'm not going to say for because he doesn't need to work for it. Who's he working with? Why did he go out and say Silicon Valley Bank's going to go under? Well, I don't. I don't get it. Unless you come up with this grand, my the grand theory of everything, which is somewhere out there, someone is att- the, the the migrant crisis for Christ's sakes. I don't have a problem with immigration. And, and you know, when you bring in immigrants, they're gonna be someone who's not like you. We don't we don't we don't import um, you know upper white middle class people from other countries. We we always have taken the down and outs who, who start at the bottom as Thomas Sowell says they start as the garment district, become bookkeepers, end up doctors and lawyers, right? In three generations. But to just open your borders, for Europe to open its borders completely and have Angela Merkel just zip it and have the the president of Hungary saying, we're not taking them, sorry guys, and then get holy hell for that. Then we do it on our borders. And and people say, well, that's because of, that's that's the Democrats trying to get votes. And I go, what kind of stupid thinking is that? These are not voters. If these guys can vote, then we're not. Then then the elections are completely hopelessly rigged, which I'm a believer they are. So there's that. Um, but 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 now there's something else going on. Uh, what we should do is contain our borders, decide how many people we want to let in and who to let in, and let them in. That's what we should do. But instead, we've got this chaos, this this controlled chaos, and we've got a president who's got the brains of a a rabbit. He's he gropes children. He's he's obviously up to his ass in corruption. He's using the FBI as pra- as his Praetorian guard. He lies so badly that he got knocked out of various presidential races because he got caught lying. He lies about everything. 
Trump says it's the biggest crowd ever. That's bullshit. Biden says I got the highest, I was the top of my class in this college that he never went to. That's a lie. Biden says stuff that are just flat out lies. And he's demented. How do we have a president who is in the bottom decile qualification? You take 100 million adults, I'd take 90 million of those as more qualified than Biden. If for no other reason is because they're not demented, they're not evil, they're not pedophiles, they're not stupid. That makes them more qualified. Yeah, it looks like there's, as you said, there's quite a lot of issues in the US, but then I go to China and there's debt issues and there's lot, lot, lots there, obviously Russia as well, Europe. Demographics. Yeah, yeah demographics, demographics Japan. Yeah, mm-hmm. there, seems, there seems to be all, the, all these issues. So I guess, and you know, if, if we go on to this potential shift, uh, in, I guess in the global order, there's going to be, it looks like there's going to be a separation between East parts of East and parts of West. So, mm-hmm. but then from my perspective, it doesn't really seem like there's any power that's going to, overcome they're all going to be almost splutter along as they are i'm not sure if you have any opinions on that well when i dig deep into something i'm always so amazed at how screwed up it is when i go deeper um and and so i assume no matter what layer of the onion i'm at i'm at the wrong one I've, I, Klaus Schwab is just a comical character. He he represents he represents Mordor in some way. The Eye of Sorn is watching us in some way, but it's not Klaus Schwab. He's an orc to keep the metaphor running. And 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 then the question is, what's it all about? It it, it seems to be about globalism could have to do with eugenics. It could have to do with, I'm a big believer in resource depletion as possible. Now, if you were at the top of the food chain, and I don't think the guys at the top all work together. I think they all just share a common interest of staying at the top of the food chain. Um, You could imagine being able to see, contrary to what Elon Musk just said the other day, that resource depletion is a huge issue. If we replaced all the cars in the United States with electric cars, we'd consume all known resources for a number of metals. So that's all, that's a stupid idea. I just read an article this morning in Forbes about five questions that no one in that world seems to be able to answer. And uh, and so then the question is, oh, Whitney Webb said it well. She said that it's estimated that the that the natural resource world we live in is a four quadrillion dollar market. She says, I I think they're going for that. So they do want to strip mine the world of its cobalt and its uranium and its fossil fuels and you name it. And and it's, it's a big grab. I just can't piece it together into a coherent picture. And it might be because there's not a central nervous system, right? It might be right the red tide. It's just the red tide. The idea, the ideology has taken root, not the people, the ideology. That's a um, that's an idea that came out of a book I just finished um, on totalitarianism um, by Matthias Desmet, The Psychology of Totalitarianism. And he, he says that the ideology takes root both at the top and the bottom. So in many ways, the people at the top are as duped by the, the new ideology. So the new ideology seems to be a, a, a form of socialism. There seems that that's a progressivism gone wild. Um, and it's possible that it's, it's that idea is what I'm sensing. There's this gigantic gravitational pull of socialism. And it's, that's a big tent. So that kind of covers a lot of otherwise mysteriously seemingly unconnected things yeah and do you i guess if we just stick to that point at the moment do you feel that yeah you know, in the 70s and 60s there was this push i guess more to the left and then people got sick of inflate high high inflation and there was some lots of issues i guess trade unions having lots of power and 
society really struggling to run and then there was almost a push to the opposite to the reagans and to the thatchers to to, to a bit more right do you see maybe potential similar trends occurring why there's going to be this massive swing one way and then 10 years later people realize like oh that doesn't work and then you know this constant swinging i feel like from one to the other i could be a a better analogy might actually be um i've got this theory that fdr wasn't as left and as clueless as the right wingers think. So, the, you know, he's a hateable guy to the right. I have this notion that FDI, FDR was looking at the world in which we were trying to figure out how to run a uh, an industrialized society, which in 1930s was really just getting on its feet and 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 then had fallen down and done a face plant. And the capitalists had shown that they didn't really know how to do it without a disaster. That was the Great Depression. The Trotskyites were making headway, saying, hey, we should be running this world top down, right? This should not be free market ideas. This should be, we should have a central nervous system constructed by smart people, powerful people. And FDR might have thought, more like a right winger, holy shit, we're about to lose if we don't put a safety net underneath Joe Sixpack. And so one could argue that he realized that capitalism had to sacrifice significantly to not lose that battle. And so it's a very astute view by that model. It's very astute, recognizing that he was playing for the big game, that is to preserve it. And then World War II hit, the entire world but us got flattened. We owned the entire global GDP. We had a wild couple of decades where we really created wealth unimaginably. And then according to Robert Gordon by 1970, that had tapered off and wealth creation had slowed down a lot. In the 1980s and 90s, it was not, we didn't create wealth like we think. What we did is we went from a very low dip, high inflation um, um, and and problematic economy. We crawled out of that and then we had monetary policy as a tailwind. And so it felt like we were booming, but um, here's the Robert Gordon, Northwest economist. I can never remember the name of the book, but it's about wealth creation. Um, said that their primary and secondary inventions, primary being things like electricity, the internet, um, indoor plumbing. Secondary inventions are things like the appliances, computers, you name it, right? And uh, he said the best decade for wealth creation for secondary inventions was the 1930s. We created more appliances in the 1930s, more things to make our lives better in the 1930s, we just weren't in a great place to fully exploit it. So we, we could, I think we're in that situation now, you know, that this idea that AI is gonna be the next huge boom, I go, I'm not, I, I really think it's a potentially a very bad idea. I, I, Again, like some of these tech companies, what they do doesn't seem to be that important to me anymore. That, that I think when they invented the laptop computer, they nailed it. When they invented the iPhone, that was pretty cool. Um, when they, the internet got up and running, that was great. But what have they done lately? What has Apple done that's new? Forget about make money, that's not new. What has Apple done that's new, right? That, what what's come since Steve Jobs first pulled the phone out of his pocket? Nothing. The cloud. I don't know. So again, Facebook. If they were destroyed tomorrow, we would be better off. They Thank put um, Salesforce.com and the Dow replaced Exxon with it. That's a clown move right there. I had to look up what salesforce.com did. It turns out they're cloud shit. Why not Google them? Why not? Why not? Why not? Why not? There, there's other companies. Why salesforce.com? 
They then proceeded to tank like, like crazy. Their earnings suck. Their revenues suck. They're a bubble company. They put them in the Dow. They took Pfizer out. <laughs> Pfizer just <laughs> sold us all garbage, but they sold a lot of it. I don't, I don't know where the, the, I don't see a boom coming. I, so I you don't, don't think AI, because I guess, you know, I've used it and it does seem quite amazing. And it seems like it could replace a lot of the work that some of us do at least. Do you not see well, that? Well, there, there's potentially that, but it also will replace thinking. Not sure that's a win. So, so um, what I've noticed in our students is they, they can retrieve stuff much better than we could. I used to have to go down to hardbound volumes. They're very difficult to use to find something from the past. Very difficult to use. And so they can retrieve it. What they have is a bunch of folders on their laptops or their iPads with PDFs in it of chemistry papers. But they don't think very hard about what's in them. It's called the unread library book. Because it's in a folder, they think they're smarter. They don't process it. They don't. And if you look at a lot of chemistry, it's very me too-ish. It's, 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 you're rewarded for just cranking. You're rewarded for volume, not quality. Um, you are punished if you go out on a limb and in any way fail, in any way fail. So if you go way out on a limb and, and, and somehow you succeed, you win big, but, but the failure rate is huge and you'll be cut off from your funding. And so that we just, I know there's areas that are making great strides. The robot guys are making phenomenal strides. They're gonna creating robots that are gonna kill us, but that's a separate issue. Boston Dynamics, yeah, just you guys just keep making those killer robots. Yeah, that is crazy. So, uh, yeah, Dave, thanks so much for your time. We've covered so many topics. I guess my last question is, what is one message you'd like people to take away from that conversation? Speak up. That's my message. When you see something that doesn't sit well with you, speak up. And so I think, I think COVID was a great lesson. So I think a lot of people shut their mouths. And I know why they were going to get fired if they spoke up. But but they should feel abused now and they should so speak up and, and, you know, shout and scream about injustices of the world. Um, even, you know, on the positive side, the, 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 the climate change crazies who I think are wrong at many, many levels, um, at least they're speaking up. I don't think they know what they're talking about, but that's a separate issue. Yeah, conversation is important as long as you're willing to listen, I guess. Someone will. Yeah. Someone will. Which is the main thing. Yeah, so thanks so much for your time. I appreciate it. So yeah. uh, would the best place to find you be on Twitter at the moment? Yeah, um, Twitter, uh, David B. Column. I write an annual year in review and every year I swear I'm not doing it again, but so far I've not lived up to that claim. Uh, Bob Moriarty, a gold bug, published two year in review books of mine. One is the 2022 year in review, which I, I can't imagine why people bought it because it's online free. Uh, a more interesting version, I think he's going to make an anthology. He's doing all the work for me. I don't understand why. He, he went back and took my 2009 to 2012 years in review and made a single volume out of that. And I think he's going to move forward. And I haven't read him in you know a decade. But he said, you can see the development of the thought process. And, and I'm a sarcastic bastard. And I think they're pretty funny. I think there's a lot of good humor in them and, and a lot of bizarre observations that are sort of looking under rocks and finding squiggly things under there. And so there's, it's about to release on Amazon 2009 to 2012 years in review. And uh, you can think of it as a Patreon thing, you know, it costs 20 bucks. <laughs> I don't know. I, I don't know why I do podcasts. I don't know what people get, but there's something. So so go go contribute $20 and read those, I guess I should say. I'm supposed to hawk a book. Um, I'm not doing it for the money. I don't think the money's big enough to do it for that, but uh, I have fun writing. 
Yeah, definitely. I really enjoyed last year's one. I'll definitely have to uh, look into that and get through three, uh, three in one book. That'll well, they're great. much shorter. They're much. That's okay. why I put them together. They're much shorter. They started out as just a handful of paragraphs in, in some ways, but um, I I should go back and read it. I, I should find out how full of crap I was back then. Um, but I'll see how you've evolved. Yes, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Thanks again for your time. I'll put that on the description below. Thank you so much for listening. And if you enjoyed the episode, please subscribe and click the bell icon so you are notified when new podcasts are released. I hope you're leaving with some great value about investing, trading, and finance. See you on the next show.